Sam, you have an invitation to song. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, it's uncanny, and at the very least, interesting how it sometimes works out. But we're going to study verses 1 through 16 of Matthew 20. If you want to be turning over to Matthew 20, we're going to be looking at those verses. <laughs> Good morning to everyone. It's good to be with you today and to study one of the most important, if not the most important subject we can look at, and that is the grace of God. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 30, notice how that chapter ended. But many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. Keep that thought in mind and look at the very first word of chapter 20. Chapter 20 begins with the word for. It's an unfortunate chapter break. There are many in the Bible, but the word for shows you that the thoughts of chapter 19 continue on into chapter 20. What the Lord is showing us in this section is that his kingdom will include many whom the local world, according to its standards, consider last. But whom Jesus, in first, in fact, considers first. And so let's look at the parable of the landowner in Matthew chapter 20. And uh, it is truly about the grace of God. Verse 1 of chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, this would be a typical scene in ancient Israel. A vineyard owner, vineyard owner during harvest, would go to the marketplace and there he would hire laborers who were eager to have the work. Most of the people in ancient times lived just a few days ahead of hunger. So they're eager to get that denarius for a day's work. Verse 2, and when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. Verse 3, he went out about the third hour. The Jewish day began at 6 o'clock, so the third hour would be 9 o'clock. He saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you too go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give that to you. And so they went. Everything Jesus said has a purpose. And so you notice that on this occasion, there's no specific amount stated. They simply trusted, and the key word is trust. They trusted that the master would compensate them fairly for their day's labor. And from this point on, the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the eleventh hour workers, that's the the arrangement that we will see is trust. They trust they will be fairly compensated for their labor. Verse 5, again he went out about the 6th and the ninth hour, 12 and 3 o'clock, and did the same thing. Verse 6, about the 11th hour, the day is nearly over, 5 o'clock, he went out and he found others standing, and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us, he said to them, you too go into the vineyard. They didn't know they would be welcome. But the master bids everyone to come. Now, beginning in verse 8, we have the application of the parable. And when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group and then to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. Now, why were the last workers paid first? Because the master wants everyone to see and witness his generosity. 
verse 10. And when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but they also received each one of denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner and they said, these last men have worked only one hour and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. Verse 13, but he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Thus, in returns to chapter 19, verse 30, the last shall be first. And the first shall be last. The master in verse 14 reminds the workers that he had done nothing unjust. They had received what they had agreed to. And in verse 15, as the master, he has the right to dispense his goods as he sees fit. And in verse 16, he says, If my generosity arouses your envy, Whose problem is that? As a rule, parables are true to life. They, they involve people, places, experiences that either did happen or could happen. But that is certainly not the case in this parable. The parable of the landowner makes no economic sense whatsoever. Equal pay for unequal labor. That's not standard business practice, and no business could operate very long on that basis. But then that's the point, isn't it? God's kingdom doesn't dispense wages. It dispenses grace. The 11th hour workers receive the same as the early workers because God is good. God is gracious, not because they earned it. The Apostle Paul would state it succinctly when he says, Man is saved by grace through faith. This not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And every person who's ever been saved from the dawn of time has been saved on that basis by grace through faith. No man puts God under obligation for anything. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus wants us to understand that grace is not something that's earned or calculated as a wage. That was the tragic error of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees. I don't think any of the gospel writers point that out more clearly than uh, what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18. Look at that section, Luke chapter 18, once again, please. Luke 18. In verse 9. <clears throat> he told this parable to certain ones, there's that word, who trusted in themselves. You see the contrast. Rather than trusting the master, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Now, that's what happens when you trust in yourself. Your perspective of everyone else is a very prideful perspective. It clouds your state of mind. And so you don't see clearly. In verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust adulterers, even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. You know, Lord, aren't you glad I'm on your team? And then verse 13, here's the, pic the picture of the tax gatherer. He's standing some distance away, unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, such as his humility, beating his breast as if to chastise himself, say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled. He who humbles himself shall be exalted. 
And so you see from the teaching of Jesus here that the, the religious leaders of this day had really imprisoned themselves within this wall of self-righteousness, trusting in myself. They considered themselves righteous on two bases. Number one, that guy over there is worse than I am, therefore I'm righteous. And the Bible makes it very clear that the only comparisons we should be making, brother and sister, is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see how we truly are. And then they had imprisoned themselves within these walls of self-righteousness by lowering the standard of the law. Jesus makes this really clear. And I look forward to studying this with you on Wednesday nights, eventually in the Sermon on the Mount, Lord willing, where Jesus shows us that the scribes and Pharisees actually believed they were keeping the law perfectly. But what they had done is they had stripped the law of its spirit and soul and body and skeletonized it down to a standard, lowered it down to a standard which suited their lifestyle. So they said, I'm not committing adultery, you know, I'm not killing anyone. But the spirit of the law says, where's your heart? Where's your mind? Are you thinking about that? Whosoever looketh upon a woman, Jesus said. But you see, they have lowered it, taken the body away, the soul away. And they said, oh, I'm keeping the law. As a result of that perspective on the law, grace or mercy had little to do with their lives. They didn't know the Lord because the grace and mercy of God, you see, was not a factor in their righteousness. And what the Lord is trying to show us here is, if you don't know God in that way, that your salvation is by the grace and mercy of God, how in the world are you going to show it to other people? You can't share what you don't have. And you can't teach what you don't know. And so here in Matthew chapter 20, that same prideful attitude is being rebuked by the Lord. The early workers in Matthew chapter 20 were upset because the master gave the 11th hour workers the same amount as themselves, even though they had agreed to that. And I love the way one writer put it. He said, their discontent arose over the scandalous mathematics of grace. The early workers didn't like the fact that the master dispenses gifts, not earnings, grace, not merit. And so the first major lesson from Matthew chapter 20 is this. Man is saved by grace through faith. And salvation by grace through faith is the only way any person can ever be saved. Once we sin that first time, that removes all merit. That removes all earning. That goes against the conventional thinking of man. We're used to earning. We're used to meriting. We're used to deserving something on the basis of these efforts. But the Apostle Paul said this in Romans 6, 23, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and truly, brother, brother and sister, we don't want what we deserve, do we? If we get what we deserve, then Paul says, but the wages of sin is death, condemnation. That's what we deserve. And the only time we'll get what we deserve is if we reject the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus always turned things upside down. He, he spoke in these paradoxes. And that, what is paradox? Truth standing on its head to get attention. He ate with publicans and sinners when other people wouldn't have anything to do with it. And Jesus said, if you're well, you don't need a physician. He forgave sin. They're so ashamed of themselves, Luke 18, they wouldn't even look up into heaven. He rejoiced greatly, greatly over a repentant son who had wasted his early life with sexual immorality and drunkenness. He invited into paradise, think about this, a repentant thief hanging on a cross beside him, beside him, begging Jesus, and as I understand the Greek, he said it repeatedly, Jesus, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. That passage is not about baptism. It's about the grace and merit and mercy of God. And it, it's, it is truly amazing grace. Eventually, Jesus welcomed into his kingdom the uncircumcised Gentiles who shared the faith of Abraham, people whom the world would definitely consider last, the Jews would consider last, but whom Jesus said would be first. That's definitely one application of Matthew 20, but it's not the only application because we see laborers coming in with earth assistance and the earth system and the earth balance. But Jesus excluded from his kingdom religious leaders such as the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who appeared righteous on the outside but inwardly were whitewashed tombs. They lived around the house of the father like the older brother but didn't know their own father because of their self-righteous attitudes. They never grasped the truth. God dispenses grace, not earnest. Now, secondly, we learn from Matthew chapter 20 that while, while God's grace is unmerited and undeserved, that doesn't mean it's unconditional. Look at the facts of Matthew chapter 20 once again. Go back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 20 and look at verse 4 with me, please. To the third hour workers, Jesus said, you too go into the vineyard. Now he's he's telling them to labor. You have labor to do. There's things for you to do. Go into the vineyard, labor. Whatever is right, I will give to you. And so they went. Again, no specific amount. Trust is the key. They simply trusted the master would fairly compensate them. They were right. And the same is true of the remaining workers. Go into the vineyard and labor. Six, ninth, eleven thousand. They all needed to labor, and they all trusted in the master. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 15, Jesus reminds them, Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I'm generous? The King James Version says good. Jesus reminds everyone what God gives is because of his goodness. Nonetheless, verse 1 Verse 1 of Matthew chapter 20 says, he went to the marketplace and there he went to find laborers. That term tells us that there's something for us to do. Our salvation is not unconditional. There's a trust and as a result of that trust, we labor, we serve. And in fact, because of our gratitude for the grace and mercy of God, we're glad to do whatever the Lord bids us to do. We're eager to learn more about him and to hear what he has for us to do because we know, just like a child with loving parents, whatever our father teaches us to do, it's for our good. It's for our good physically, it's for our good mentally, it's for our good spirit, especially spiritually. In a similar metaphor, John 15, the parable of vine and branches, Jesus said in verse 2, I am the vine, you are the branches. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And as a branch, the Lord expects us to bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faith. The Lord expects us to grow fruit. And in verse 8 of John 15, Jesus said, bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciples. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's not just to prove love. I don't think Jesus said just to prove love. I think he said that in addition, because you love me. Because you love me, bear much fruit. And that is, that is certainly the relationship we want to have with the Lord. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 23, Matthew 20, verse 23, he said to them, my cup you shall drink. He asked the disciples, are you willing to partake of my cup, the cup of suffering? And they said, yes, Lord, we're willing to do that. He said, indeed, you will. And so sometimes being a disciple of Jesus means that we must suffer for Jesus. There are trials we must go through. We must suffer for Jesus. While it is by grace through faith, it is not unconditional. 
in chapter 20, verse 26, greatness in the kingdom, Jesus teaches, is measured in terms of service, not being served. Verse 26, he says, is it not so, it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so being a disciple of Jesus Christ involves laboring in his vision, means serving the Lord just like Jesus serve the Father. You can't do any better than Jesus. The key to faithful discipleship was taught by Jesus just a few days earlier. Look back at chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18. Jesus summarizes the kind of spirit he wants his disciples to have. Verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, who then is greatest in the kingdom? Of heaven. He called a child to himself, and he stood that child in their midst. And Jesus said, Here's a, a visual demonstration. Here's this little child that could leave a lifelong impression. He said, Truly, I, I say to you, if you don't become like this little child right here, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus, again, was rebuking their pride and self and say, you know, in some ways you need to think about something in regard to this child and be converted and transformed so you become like this child. But what was Jesus talking about? I believe as you look on through the rest of that verbal neighborhood, he's talking about humility, he's talking about dependence, he's talking about a person who is holy in need. Of another. And so Jesus is saying a transformation has to take place. As our young brother just said a few moments ago, it's, it's not just a few changes here. In this. It's a transformation from a prideful spirit, self sufficient spirit, to a childlike spirit, which is wholly dependent on the parent, wholly in need of the parent. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Same thing. I'm destitute. I'm impoverished without my Savior, spiritually speaking. A child can't provide for himself. The child is wholly dependent on the parent. His life, his food, his shelter, his training, his very existence depends on the grace of that parent. Without a parent or a guardian to provide for him, that child will die. Well, a good and wise child then realizes that he is completely dependent on his parents. And if he has good parents, he learns to trust those parents and listen to those parents, knowing whatever they say for him to this world. And so, is the exhortation then part of the lesson? Isn't this what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 22? In this wonderful treatise, the most complete treatise on the subject of the gospel, for 11 chapters, as we've divided it, Paul has just demonstrated how gracious and how merciful God is in providing salvation for sinful men. And so in chapter 12, where the application is made, he says, look at this, he says, what God has done. I urge you that by the mercies of God, 11 chapters, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies, living, holy sacrifices, which is your reasonable service of worship. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God. So what is he saying? He's saying, when you look at the mercy and the grace of God and what he offers as a gift, gratitude alone, gratitude alone should lead us to serve the Lord. And so, yeah, there's definitely things that we need to do based on what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. And so when Jesus said, come unto me all who are weary and heavy weight, take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. 
happy to take whatever yoke he gives. Happy to take whatever burden he gives, knowing he'll be in the yoke with you. He's with you, pulling with you. You're not alone. And when Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Happy to do that. Glad to do that. If that means the gift is something he will provide for me, it is. The victory is won. I just want to be a part of that victory march. And Jesus said, baptism is a part of it. That's, in fact, showing your commitment to him. And it's certainly for the remission of sins. A man was driving along and suddenly noticed a car that was on fire. And so he pulled over and ran over to the car. And he saw a person inside that burning car. And so he broke the window and as quickly as he could, as painlessly as he could, he pulled that man out of that room. Saved his life, no question about it. The medics came and helped the man further, took him to the hospital and took care of him at that point. And so the man saw that his work had been done and he drove on. Years later, that, that same man who was in that burning car committed a terrible crime. And so he was in court, and there he was. He'd been charged, he's in court. He's standing before the judge, and he learns that that judge he's standing before is the same man that had pulled him out of that burning heart. And he says that. He says, you're the man that pulled me from the burning car. You saved my life. And the judge said, yes. Then, on that day, I was your Savior. But today, I'm your judge. Right now, Jesus is your Savior. And he's done everything you need to be saved. Abundant grace, abundant mercy. We just need to take advantage of it. Knowing that someday, he will be our judge. Make the wise decision. And give your life to him. You will never regret it. Will you come and ask the same thing as the same place? I have desired to follow Jesus.